What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Black Belt Business Podcast. I'm your host, Elliot Marshall, and it is my goal with each episode of this podcast to share the stories, strategies, tactics, tools, and resources that will help you establish or grow your martial arts school. The Black Belt Business Podcast is brought to you by Easton Online. You can find all of our digital courses, martial arts curriculums, and resources designed to help you enhance your business at easton.online. So without further ado, let's jump into the episode. All right, Excellent. good job, fellas. All right, I'm glad we did that. Um, everyone, welcome back. Black Belt Business Podcast, Easton Online. Go check us out, easton.online, easton underscore online on Instagram. Uh, if you have any questions, fill out all that stuff and we will get back to you. Um, Phipps Jordan, what up, fellas? How are we doing? What's up? Doing great. Howdy. What is it, Friday afternoon? Nice rainy Friday afternoon. We're down yeah. here in Breaking the office. The yeah, finally, right? Mm-hmm. Finally. It's been nice. It's been nice. Um, man, I've had one question, really, that I've been thinking about all day. And I think a lot of our academy owners think about the same thing. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to talk about core values, okay? Because we talk about core values enough. I think everyone knows that you have to have core values I th- you know, and, and, all, and all that stuff, right? But goddamn motherfuckers, how do you get people to do the work? Right? How do you get people to teach the class they're supposed to class sp- supposed to teach in the way that they're supposed to teach them and like some actual particulars? Now, I agree with you, right? Like core values are super important. That's what gets them bought in and all of that, right? But we talk about them so much, right? We talk about them so much. How about some nitty-gritty dude? Why are you teaching the class that way? when it so obviously says teach the class this way and we can take that to everywhere in the school right like Mm -hmm. we can take to the gm role that you used to play like Uh, come on man make the phone calls the way the phone calls are written out and we've shown you videos to be made i have thoughts do you do your damn job phipps how do you get people to do their damn job you're a dh yeah right you're a dh so to explain to everyone your job a little bit, it comes down to you. Mm-hmm. You're a DH of one school. It's your job to get a particular instructor or all the instructors of Longmont, Longmont to teach the class how they're supposed to be taught. Yeah, this is a this is an important question. This is a question I ask myself a lot. And also, <laughs> this is a question I do not have the answers to right now. Like, I am constantly like thinking, like, what do I need to do to make sure that everyone on the striking team in Longmont is on the same page. And I think every one of the coaches has been trained really well. And I think they all teach great classes. But I go in and I see different things, like just small aspects of the class that exactly like you said, why are you teaching it like that? Where where did this come from? And um, I think part of it comes down to just a natural entropy. Like you get done shadowing, you know exactly how classes are supposed to be taught. You've been taught exactly how class is supposed to go. And you come out of the gate and you're killing it. But over time, like things change, you get a little bit more comfortable, you get a little bit more lax in your preparation and the entropy occurs. And slowly you start falling off the center line, right? You start diverting and it's just little by little. And then, you know, in my position, I don't teach too many intro level classes, too many kickboxing classes. So when we start training a new kickboxing coach i'm relying on like kind of the veterans on the striking team to do that but they're slightly off of course right now and so then we just get more and more off of course mm-hmm. so i've really been trying to rack my brain about how to bring everyone back and i think um i'm not doing any of this yet but i'm like okay we need to go back to something that jordan used to do as as the gm slash de facto bjj department head is he would come in and he would evaluate like once a year, maybe, maybe once every couple quarters, he'd come in and evaluate our classes. And he talked to us about like what the, what the evaluation means and, and all the good things in class and all the things that we need to be doing to be back on the same course together. And as a DH, I haven't been doing that. Um, but I'm going to start doing that because that's something I, I've, I don't know. I don't have the answers and I would like to hear what Jordan's been thinking about. I'm going to interrupt you for a second. And just so that we don't just shit on people who have uh, diverged from what the standard is. Mm-hmm. When I was up in Longmont a couple months ago with the Easton Online guys, 
I said I would teach the jujitsu classes and Phil, or Phil asked me to. I was like, yeah, let's go. I'll do it. And I had a fundamentals class first and I haven't taught a fundamentals class since COVID. And when I lined everyone up, I was like, oh God, the warm up. How does it go? <laughs> I was like, I don't know the warm up. I was like, I don't remember the warm up. I haven't taught a warm up mm -hmm. in two and a half years. Like the, the fundamentals warm up. I mean, so I just owned it. I was like, yo guys, I'm going to butcher this warm up. Let's just get through it. My fault. Yeah. Uh, so it's a natural thing that happens that with like all these things that you're just talking about, whether it's, what was the word entropy you said? Or, yes. Entropy. Okay. Or whether it's like, you think you got it a little bit. You want to put your own flair on it a little bit. And every instructor goes through this. So, uh, let, let, we're, we're not talking about any of this to be like, oh man, the coaches up in Longmont are fucking shitty and different or any of that. This is mm -hmm. natural at every school, yes. every academy across the country. Jordan, go. Yeah, it is natural. I, I like that word entropy because I do think it's human nature to decay, like whatever we're doing, whether it's just growing older or we, we get really good at something and then over time the entropy happens and we decay. I've encountered this a lot. Um, you know, this, this model of going to different places and evaluating and trying to make sure that they're staying the course and that entropy hasn't uh, veered too far off course. Like that's a big part of the program director role. And so if, let's stop for a sec. Let's yeah. understand your role again, real fast, just in case sure. this is somebody's first time. Jordan, you're the program director. Mm -hmm. Your job is mostly to deal with the DHs of a program. Yes. Sir. Right. Right. Uh, not Phipps's particular program. Right. But you deal a lot with DHs mm -hmm. so that they're then going and making sure that they're instructors. So you're right. you're a level above there as far as the passing it down. You're not dealing uh, with the actual instructor for, say, in Denver on the mat so much. You're dealing with that. Yeah. Yeah. Not always. I mean, sometimes I do work directly with an instructor if they happen to be there teaching on the day that I'm visiting. And right. There's something I want to talk to them about. But. More often than not, it gets funneled through the DH. And, and the DH at each program, the department head, is who we should be looking to to set the model, right? Like what Phipps just described. Like everybody's modeling the way that he taught the classes, and he's modeling himself off of the Muay Thai program director who's Sean Madden, right? So Sean Madden has a way that he has the vision, the Easton vision of the way these things go. He imparts that vision to... FIPS, and then he imparts that to the instructors and so on and so forth, right? But what I've noticed, and I encountered this at the GM level, and I'm seeing this uh, so much uh, across all of the schools now that, um, you know, we've been doing these podcasts, and I'm at the point now where I've probably been to every school over the last seven months, like two to three times now. And so I've really started to develop this clear, elevated perspective of what's going on. And I'm going to back up and use my experience of what happened at the GM level. So I noticed that at a certain point, there was a generation of fundamentals instructors on the jujitsu side. And again, this isn't to shit on anybody. This right. is just yeah. an observation. Um, is that the energy level in the fundamentals classes weren't what the previous generation of fundamentals instructors was, right? So I was investigating. I'm like, why did this occur? So the fundamentals instructors that shadowed me, that modeled me, right, they hit the mark. The fundamentals instructors that shadowed a different crop, I wasn't involved anymore because I had replaced myself. That was where we started to lose some fidelity. And I realized across the board, this is like a game of telephone, right? This is, this is the the organizational problem of scale. This is what everybody deals with. And this is why a lot of schools don't duplicate, why they don't scale. Like we know there's people we're friends with that own schools that have no aspirations to have a second one because they don't want to deal with the headache, right? Because uh, being people dependent in one school is easy. When you have two schools, if you are people dependent, scaling and maintaining the fidelity of the culture of the systems of the product becomes much more difficult because every single person that you might be depending on has their own interpretation and perspective of what's going on. Right. And, like, and look, they're your student. Sure. And they're probably shorter on the journey than you are mm -hmm. and not as good as you maybe. Yeah. That's part of it. Experience yeah. and skill and inherent talent. Like these are all pieces of it, but 
you know, just all things considered equal, this problem still exists, right? So, you know, what I've noticed is that the, the chain of communication being people dependent makes this problem very difficult to tackle, right? Because if we're just like, okay, the program director goes, models the class, the staff sees it. Okay. I still have no control, even though I might've taught the best fucking class that they've ever seen. I have no control over what they did or did not pay attention to or what their interpretation of what they just saw was, you know, like I've heard this happen where, you know, I'm going around, I'm pumping the kids up, I'm yelling, I'm cheering and stuff like that. And then I've heard like some people who have observed me doing that, they just see it as me yelling at the kids to like get them pumped up. They don't actually hear the specific jujitsu feedback that I'm giving them, or they don't see the praise correct praise tactic that I'm using to get them pumped up. They don't realize this is part of my three by three where I'm trying to make them feel seen and heard. They may not get all that, right? They just have their interpretation of it. And that may or may not be an accurate interpretation of reality. And so if they didn't understand something and there's a gap in their understanding, well, then they fill it in the best they know. And then that's really where you start to lose fidelity. It really is the game of telephone that we all played in kindergarten. Like just the further you get away from the source, uh, it loses quality, right? So my hypothesis and what I'm really trying to tackle now is how do we create sources that scale? Right? How do we reduce the ability to erroneously interpret something? Right? Um, if you go and teach a class, right, at a school, and all these instructors see it, and then it's six months before you go and teach another class, well, there's a whole crop of staff who have never seen that model, right? Like, like right now, we're very people dependent in the way that we do things. Like our entire meeting structure, even, I think, is very people dependent. So if we can set out to devise pipelines and systems that centralize these models, right? Like if we had some sort of class that existed in the ether, that every time somebody was trained up, they were all looking and watching at the same thing. And there was some sort of uh, assessment to discern whether or not they interpreted this model the way that we want them to, right? If we can do that, and use that as the way to disseminate these things, then I think that we've started to chip away at this problem of scale. And I hope I'm articulating this well because yeah. I see it in my head. But I also don't think it's a silver bullet. It can't be because I, I was just about to say, because part of the best class you've ever taught is the feeling in the room. Yes. And you cannot get that other than by being in the room. You yes. have to be in the room to get right, that. Right, right, right. You do, and then this is cool because I'm gonna I'm gonna tie this back to a conversation that Phipps and I had, and and this is a project that we started, and I hit pause because I realized I needed to rewind and work on some other things before I get back to this. But you know, like we're trying to create a video model of a kids class, and one thing that we talked about was, man, we can record it, they can see how I do it, they they can see the structure, we can do voiceover, we can explain all these things but they're not going to feel the energy. And I agree. Like I, I think the, the hallmark difference between an amazing class in a good class is when I'm sitting on the sidelines and it's awesome to be there. Right? Like I go to some schools, I watch some kids instructors and it is magic just being in that room. You know, you look down the sidelines, you see the parents, they're not on their phones. They're like buddy, buddy with each other. They're looking, they're having fun. They're engaged. Then you go to some classes and there's nothing interesting calling their attention on the sidelines and it feels different. It doesn't feel good to be in the room. So, but I think like, just like we were talking about Oppenheimer as we were like getting set up, how Christopher Nolan used the language of cinema to create an experience so you could feel what the character is feeling, right? And then I'm, I'm getting really <laughs> off track here. But I think, I hope that there's a way artistically that we can start to create these models and use the, the language of these mediums of video and cinema to where we can try and duplicate as skillfully as possible the energy. Like if we can create a really badass video 
that feels just as cool to watch as it is to be in the room during a kid's class, we'll start to chip away at that. But it, it's never You're never going to replace No, it. it's never going to be the same. Yeah. But we can work in that direction. I'm... You're never going to replace the en the energy of Henzo on the mat with him and how he says it and the things that he does and interacts with everyone. And uh, even when he's yelling at someone and asking them, yo, man, what the fuck? Like if you, if you uh, in, in a vacuum, let's just say on the bat, and I'll use me for an example, mm -hmm. in a vacuum, if you just hear me be like, motherfucker, what are you doing? You're like, yeah. oh my God. Right? Like, oh, oh, oh my yeah. God. Right? But if you're in the class feeling the energy, knowing who I'm talking to and all that, it can be just fine. The and context it, it, it is can, different. It can yeah, add, to the, it can add right. to the feeling of the class. Right? Yeah, Without totally. a doubt. So I agree with you. We're never, go we're never going to, but it could aid in. Right? It could aid in. It can aid. Yeah. And then when they see the person, and then so when they watch it and then they experience it, now it helps their perception change to be like, okay, this, this, this is the North Star that I'm looking for. Right. And and that's what I'm talking about is is there has to be some sort of model and system to where the North Star that everybody is aiming at is consistent every single time. Because if you rely on people to be that North Star. Like, man, I, I don't teach the same class every time I teach. Like, man. Even if it's the same class. Yeah, even if it's the same class. Like, I mean, just Wednesday this week, man, I was just having a rough day, you know? And I really had to do a lot of work, a lot of emotional labor to pull myself out of that and, you know, teach the class, right? That's completely different if I had been rolling in there having the best day of my life. Like, I'm going to be in a completely different zone. They're still both are great classes. But there's one that I want to be the model that everybody aims at, right? And I've been encountering this problem as I, as I invite the department heads from the other schools to come up to the school that I teach at uh, so they can see what I do. And then that way, when I'm making recommendations to them, like they've seen an example of what I'm talking about and what can be achieved. But like, man, I've, there's all these different variables. Like, man, sometimes they show up and the attendance isn't as strong as I would like. And so that has an inherent effect on the energy. So it's not quite the same, you know, and sometimes they show up on the right day and it's lightning in a bottle. And I'm like, yes, you saw what the potential is here, you know, and now I know that you really have a strong model that you're aiming at. Right. So these things can fluctuate. And even though like and I'll just use a video as an example, like if we have a video model of what the best class is that we're all aiming at even though that can never fully replace the in-person experience, and we're not trying to, what it does allow us to do is it gives us a systematic, consistent, every single time set of inputs for every single person. So if we notice at a foundational level that something is missing, then we can tweak our inputs until we're getting the outputs that we desire. But I think that, I'm not saying it's, impossible when you're people dependent, but to really do it well, we, you really have to shift to making a systems dependent, um, company. You know I mean? This goes back to the E-myth, right. like system dependent versus people dependent. But I think it's really difficult to think in that way. For sure. Right. I, I don't think that, and I, and I'm not trying to toot my own horn or anything like that. It's just, I go back to, um, Ray Dalio's book principles. And, and I can't remember what the five dimensions were, but he, something that Ray Dalio does in his company is he, he takes every individual that he works with and he creates like a baseball card for them. And on the back of the card, he has stats of their strengths and weaknesses. And so he literally like cold heartedly <laughs> will design teams based on stats. Right. And he's like, if you want to have a successful company, Traits, yeah, or like ways of thinking, mm -hmm. right? And so this this big picture, systematic style of thinking is an aspect of what it takes to be really good at business or build a successful company. He's like, I know very few people in this world that are good at all of these types of thinking. And he's like, I include myself. I myself am not good at all of these things. And he's a genius, right? right? And uh, so it's... And I think that that trait of being able to think about how we systematically approach these problems um, can be an elusive one at times. 
That was long. Anything to add? No, Jordan says, like, you should just talk to Jordan, honestly. Like, I'll just sit here and take it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's not nothing true. I have to say or offer that's going to be Look, let's out. talk about some don'ts. Like, this is a good way to get to do's mm-hmm. sometimes, right? Mm-hmm. Is, is you're watching someone just butcher a class, mm-hmm. butcher a sale, butcher something. Mm-hmm. What do you do? I mean, I know what I used to do. I know what I do. What do we not do? What do yeah, like what, what, what? I know what I used to. So when I That's say what do you terrible. not do is what I was is what I used to do. Yeah. Right. I used to stop them. Right. I used to walk in and stop them and be like, I'm gonna take this over because you are fucking utterly butchering this. And I, without saying that, right, but just in my mind. Yeah. Right. Because. Uh, as much as you were just saying to become system dependent, mm-hmm. at the end of the day on the front line, we're very people dependent. Mm-hmm. Yes. Right? Have to be. We're, we're, you, it's people doing everything. Yes. Right? We don't have a, and you, a you kiosk. You can't replace that. Right. 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 We're, that, it's part of who Easton is. Well, like it's part of never... what any martial arts school is. There's no way you're going to ever just watch a video, yep. have no instructor on the mat, and learn from the video and have not sa- – <laughs> There are schools that do that. That's crazy. That's fucking stupid. Just saying, but it does exist. No, no instructor. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, it was, um, you remember when Sachi was still around, there was uh, one of our first potential clients for Easton Online back when we were just, when we were, had a different sales model, when we were just trying to sell a la court cart mm-hmm. courses. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a guy who signed up for our course and then he didn't like the course and we asked him for some feedback and we found out a lot about his school and that was his model is he had set up a martial arts school that was completely automated to where literally you would show up and watch a video on an iPad and then that was you drilling the technique. Oh, that so guy's either out of business or a McDojo. It's just a completely different model. It's not what we're about. Like nobody's showing up at that school for the community or to get good. Or to get good. No, I don't think any world champions are coming out of that I don't, school. I don't I think all. any no. fucking silver medalist that fucking grappling industries at a white belt level. No, is coming it's, out of that it's probably one one moderate step above, you know, training with somebody in your garage following an online curriculum. You know? So it does exist, but it, it's not who Easton is. Like it's an intentional part of our culture that we are that we build relationships and we invest in people and and that's not going away. That's that's a huge part of what we would consider our secret sauce of what makes Easton Easton is it's the community. Uh, yeah, we've been doing it since it was like official that we were doing it. Sure. Right. Right. Like, you know, right. that that that's how that this whole thing came around because of that. Right. Right? Like because yeah. it was right. before it was officially a thing, it was the thing. Yeah. yeah. So I guess to answer your question, what happens when somebody's fucking it up? Fips. You're wa- you're walking in on a kickboxing class. And that instructor's just fucking butchering it. <clears throat> I will save my critique for after the class. It, it's not something that there's no no admonishment that I can hand out that's going to fix the situation right there. So, for example, um, and this has happened in, in recent memory, I've walked in right at the end of a class and I see the instructor, someone who's kind of new, and they're, they're giving the announcements, right? So everyone's lined up and they're giving the announcements and they're holding the board and it's right in front of their face and they're like reading line from line. And it's just like no one who is listening to this instructor right now knows what these announcements are because you don't know what they are. So instead of being like, Hey dude, you just fucked that up really bad. <laughs> <laughs> I sent him a Vox, right? Um, and it was after I coached, cause I was coaching right after him. Yeah. Uh, I sent him a Vox like, Hey, uh, I recommend that you know what the announcements are at the beginning of your class. So look at the board, know what they are. And then you have that in your hand to remind you like of details is not the thing that you read off of. So I basically said, don't read the announcements anymore. And I came in a couple weeks later and he's doing much better job. He just needed a small course correction. And most of the time that's what it is. It's, it's, hardly ever wholesale like you are bombing this entire process because you don't get to be a coach if, if that's you know if you can't do it right so it's small course corrections and so whenever i see that i just try to address it as quickly as possible obviously i didn't talk to him right then and i i coached my class so it was probably a couple hours later but it was the same day just sent him a box like hey 
this is what I saw. This is how it could be better. And I'd like to see you work on that. And they were really thankful for it. And so to me, it's just small course corrections. Like I can't do everything. And that's not what a leader is supposed to do. I'm supposed to empower everyone else who is, um, I don't want to say under me, but everyone that I'm supposed to be managing, um, I need to empower them to be as good or hopefully ideally better than me. And so a lot of the time it's small course corrections. And when I see it, and that's why I want to go to starting to do some evaluations because I know everyone's doing mostly a good job, but there's probably one or two things that if we can just offer the small course corrections, they're going to be doing an even better job. My wife and I used to have this, well, we created this rule with our second child. Because our first child, Kanan, we argued at 3 a.m. all the fucking time. Because like one person comes in to help or whatever, or you're both just up and it's like, well, I think we should do this and I think we should do that. You're exhausted. No one slept in weeks. And boom, blow up. Right? Well, the second child, Simon, we put someone in charge and we did shifts. Mm-hmm. Right? So... uh His bedroom, Simon's bedroom was down the hall and there's another bedroom right down the hall. So somebody had a 10 to two shift and someone had a two to six shift, right? So whoever's in charge, 10 to two, you're handling, you're handling, right? The other person doesn't even come, right? And then at two o'clock, whenever that feeding was, you, you do the feeding, you go switch, go back to sleep and then it's their turn. But there are times when you need help. Yeah. Right? There are times when you need help. And the other person comes down, they hear it's a nightmare, whatever it is. It became the rule that the second person could only assist and give no feedback unless they thought the child's life was in danger. Yeah, I love it. I love it. <laughs> right? It must have been so hard at times. And then if you think the kid's life is in danger, then you can intervene. But then you also need to get a divorce afterwards, right? <laughs> <laughs> You know? So you know, so you're never intervening. You're just helping. Yeah. And then whatever you thought was different, you talked about at 10 a.m. When the sun's up, whether you slept or not, 10 a.m. is way easier than 3 a.m. Yeah. Right? It's just way easier. I, I don't know why it is, but it is. So you're saying that, right? Like you, you, you had a, a 3 a.m. Yep. I- incident. They are the one in charge. Right. They're the one in charge. I'm just there to assist, but afterwards we'll talk about it. Afterwards we'll talk about it, right? And that and uh, that kind of I, I've kind of taken this to the teacher because man, let me tell you, I no offense to anybody, again, like I I've been doing this the second longest to them all, maybe longer than them all, like actually teaching, because I started young, so I see I can see some mistakes, right? Like I see plenty of mistakes. And you just can't you have to keep your mouth shut. You have to keep your mouth shut, and then you have to I personally like to start with a question. Hey man, can you tell if, if I'm in person with them? Can you tell me what you were, th- what why it is you showed it that way? Mm. Just just to hear their logic first, at least, right? Like, I'm always done that. Yeah, you know, can you tell can you tell me why it is you showed showed it that way? So I can at least understand why it is that you thought you were teaching it right when you were just fucking butchering it. <laughs> That's awesome. That reminds me of a of a time where I'm all approached me like that and asked me why I was teaching something a certain way. And then I explained it to him and then he tried it and he goes, Oh yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. So, so it was like a genuine question. On nice. His part. And I was like, awesome. Fuck. Yeah. Yeah. And there was plenty of times where it didn't go that way, but yeah. that one particular time. Was like, and look, everyone's had this. Let, let me be clear. I've had them all take my class from me. <laughs> <laughs> like li- literally just be like, yeah, goodbye. Get out of the class. And I was like, oh, where that one? Okay, cool. Fuck off. I, I can remember feeling fuck off. Yeah. And I was a white belt and he was a purple belt. Uh-huh. So uh, it sucks, yeah. right? That sucks. That's not what we want to be doing. Jordan, what are your some of uh, your don't do's? Well, a couple of things came to mind, and, and this is a little nuanced, but you know, at, from my thinking back to my GM hat and, and, keeping people accountable is a big part of the GM role. Mm -hmm. Um, They're the accountability arm of Easton, so to speak. And um, it was interesting. I went to a conference like a year and a half, two years ago now, and there was a talk about the difference between accountability versus responsibility. And I won't go fully into it, but one thing that I took away from it was you can't hold someone accountable to something that they have not agreed to. And so like that, if it was like a staff problem, you know, like uh, at the front desk, like they weren't selling the way that they need to be selling. 
I would first ask myself, is there something missing? Like, did I not communicate something to them? Like, did they not understand that they agreed to do it this way? So I would ask questions, right? I would ask, be like, why did you do it that way? And that would illuminate whether or not uh, I had communicated to them what I wanted them to be accountable for. It's it's easy because you can even then ask that question. Mm -hmm. Even if you thought you did, right? You're like, I swear I told you, yes. you need to say the word enroll, not sign up. Yes. Right? So right. you can ask the question, hey, did I tell, did, why are we using the word sign up instead of enroll? Mm -hmm. And they can be like, well, blah, 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 blah. And they can give you an answer. And you're like, have I ever communicated to you that I want you to use the word enroll? And they might be like, no. No. And even if you did, right, if their perspective is that you did not, <laughs> well, then we got to back up and we got to figure this out. But, you know? it, but it leads to such an easy conversation. It does. Great. It does. We're, we're saying it right now. We right. need to use the word enroll rather than sign up. Can we agree that this happens. Yes. And now right. now you're golden, right? Now you're golden. Because yeah. at the end of the day, that one sign up doesn't really matter that much. Mm -hmm. Right? Like it's not going to make or break the school. Mm -hmm. Right. But if they continue to do that in perpetuity, it could really affect your sign up rate and then, you know, everything. But then also, I also think of praise, correct praise, like how we teach instructors to handle things on the mat. I mean, that it sounds so cliche and trite and people also refer to it as a shit sandwich and like... When somebody is praise correcting, uh, praising me, like I know exactly what they're doing. I know they're saying something I did well first, so then they can then deliver something critical and constructive, and then to make it feel better, uh, they tell me something good again, right? I know that they're doing it, but it still works. Look, I like just it still this, makes it easier. I just had this conversation with somebody about coaching pro fighting, pro fucking fighters, mm -hmm. right? And like getting, and, and you do, you, you praise correct praise. Yeah. You don't sit down and go, yo, motherfucker, <laughs> <laughs> right. right? Very rarely, yeah. right? Like it works in like the third or fifth round of a fight that you're obviously losing, mm -hmm. right? Like, yo, motherfucker, you got to get in his ass right now. Mm -hmm. But it's obvious, right? That's like right before you're about to fire somebody too, mm -hmm. right? Where, you know, yeah. but like when I sit down after a fight, after a round, and whether we won or lost the round, I look at my fighter, I say, take a deep breath. Okay, you did this well. Does that make sense? What I need you to do is this. And then rather than praise again, I generally go back to having them repeat what it is that I yeah, need them to do right. to get an agreement That's out of them tactic. so that mm -hmm. we end on them telling me what the agreement is. Yes. I got to tell a funny story real fast. We were, we're uh, <laughs> tangent. <laughs> okay. So I'm doing this once, right? This is Elliot going on a tangent. I'm shocked. Shocked. Uh, so I'm sitting there with a fighter. Uh, Mikey Baldwin, one of Donald Cerrone's friends, who I just ended up cornering somehow. I don't fucking know. Uh, Donald asked me to. Uh, and I did that. I told him, you know, it looked this well, but he was messing up his rubber guard. Mm. Right, you know? And I said, okay, what I need you to do with the rubber guard is A, B, C. Do you understand that? And he goes, yeah, I understand it. I was like, what are you going to do? He's like, I'm going to walk out there and fuck him up. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like where are you going to do that? All right. <laughs> you, where are you going to do that? Oh, and he man. walked out there and fucked the dude up. So whatever. But yeah. Oh, man, that's too good. So anyway, yeah. you yeah. like, And that's kind of the praise correct for praise in it the is. sense of getting an agreement back. It kind of mixes what we were talking about in two ways. Yeah. I mean, it's just – I it. So just, I'm just saying for people that call it a shit sandwich. Yeah. Man, you do it at the fucking highest level. You, you do. do. You do it at the highest level. And I, and I know Leon Edwards' coach of yelling at him at the, in between the fourth and the fifth round worked. But they didn't do that in round one. Yeah. Right? You do that when you got to hit a hell fucking Mary. And let's be honest, in that fight, that's what Leon hit. He hit a hell, fuck, hell fucking Mary. So, right. Uh, I, th I think it's very human to just be defensive. Mm-hmm. Right. And like I noticed with the, the kids that I coach, I have a lot of rapport with a lot of the kids that I coach. And, and I'm sure you've noticed, like when you have a lot of rapport with a student, you don't always got to put on your padding and praise right, them right. first and everything. You can just be like, no, 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 no. You fuck that up. You need to fix this. You did this with right? me at parents. Oh, what did I do? You like got off the mat and you're like, I don't want to hear that. I did well. Tell me what I did wrong. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't need to. You didn't. You didn't. Need, yeah. You didn't need that. So because we have yeah. that relationship, right. I'm not like. Uh, 
Yeah, it's different, right. you know, but like, man, when you had first started coaching me, though, that might have been difficult for me. Uh, but, you know, I've noticed with the kids that I coach, like when I see them bare and bolo improperly and I go over there and I start correcting them without telling them how awesome they looked first, they always they do this. They go, oh, I know. And I'm like, well, if you knew that gray belt, <clears throat> then why did you do it wrong? Right. But it, that's not helpful. But what I've noticed the difference is, is if I first say, man, that was dope. That Baron Bolo was awesome. I was like, can I give you a tip to make that even better? And they're like, yeah. And then I give them the tip. And then I'm like, do you understand? They're like, oh, okay. Yeah, that's cool. I could give them the exact same correction in a different order. And they're going to want to tell me that they already know what I'm talking about or they're working on something different first. And that's why they weren't doing what I corrected or something. And I'm just like, my favorite no. is that I didn't do that. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. No, I didn't do that. And it's like, I just watched. You I actually it, brought but. my 3 p.m. class in the other day because two people told me that back to back. And well, one told me I was wrong and the, and the other one told me they didn't do that. Amazing. And I was like, hey, everyone get in right now. Bring it in. <laughs> I was like, I'm not wrong. I was like, I've dedicated my entire life to this since I was six years old. I'm very rarely wrong in a live go, like in a stressful fight. I might say right hand when it needed to be left hand. Like, okay, but that's with pressure. I guarantee you, I'm not fucking wrong while watching you standing there and you're doing it and I'm not. And my sole job is to watch you do it. Yeah. I'm not wrong. I totally get it. Yeah. I it's totally fucking frustrating. It. And, yeah. and the more experience or time you put into anything, I think that it gets increasingly frustrating because I've noticed the longer I do this, the longer I coach, the more when people react that way, I'm like, I'm like, think about how long you've been doing this versus how long I've been doing this. But it takes a lot of humility and awareness for somebody when they're being corrected to sit here and go, you know what, even though I don't agree with what they just said, let's think about some facts here. I'm six months into this. This person's 20 years into this. They have a black belt. I have a blue belt. Uh, let me think about like whether or not I actually know what I'm talking about. Like That thought process very rarely goes through anybody's head. Phipps is actually really good at that. Like I see him like just default to humility all the time, but I think that's a very rare quality to have. But this is why the praise, correct praise works at so the well. highest levels to coaching kids work so well. It's just because just by telling somebody that they did something well first, that the doors are open, yeah. the doors are open, right? But if you just start right away with what somebody did wrong, it's more likely than not that they're just going to shut that door in your face. And it's not, you know, um, Alex, I talked to him a lot about how he likes to give feedback and he almost exclusively tries to give feedback through positive reinforcement because he finds that it's very efficient that way. You know, it's almost like any time I've ever talked to him about like my matches or classes or what's going on, it's almost like he just skips what anybody did wrong and he just focuses on what you did well and somehow that has the way of getting you to latch on to what you did well and continuing to do that but then it gets you to think about what he didn't say you know it's like he didn't address this and this didn't go well so maybe this is an area i need to work on kind of thing it's kind of i'm not even sure how I it works exactly. yeah i don't know if i fully agree with you there well, I might be yeah, misarticulating for sure. how he does it, but, and it's not always like but, sometimes right. you straight up have to you be have to direct with somebody. You you right. Cause them. I don't want, we're not going down the route of like only telling people the positive. No, no, no not always, yeah. but yeah. it's, uh, but I, I get what he's saying. Like when I go to the other schools and I want to give them feedback on their program, right? Like if I just point out all the things that I think are lacking, uh, it's going to be really hard for them, you know? But if I give them a lot of, it's almost like proximity praise in the classroom, right? Like when a student is doing something really well and you say, man, this person is really focused and working really hard. Good job. Right. All the other people want to do it. Right. It's kind of like that. Like right. that's how he does it, you know? Yeah. And you have to correct. And you have to correct. You have to correct. Sure. It's just the manner in which you do it. It is. Right? It, it really comes down to the matter what you do it. And I will also say the relationship, because you brought this up too, mm -hmm. the relationship you have with the person. 
Mm-hmm. Right? Because this it, it's such a big one. Yeah. Like, uh, I've coached you a bunch. Mm-hmm. So I so when you were like, yo, skip the other stuff, tell me what I did wrong. Mm-hmm. You're fine with it. Yes. I don't think I've ever coached you. Mm-hmm. I couldn't do that. No, I need you to be nice to me, bro. What's that? I, said, <laughs> I need you to be nice to me, please. I'm saying in a live moment. Yeah. Like, it, it, would, it would be a little different. Mm-hmm. Right? I, I, I wouldn't just come up to you and be like, yo, Phipps, you fucking, you did ABC wrong. We need to fix, you know, I would never do that. The camera over here, different fucking story. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the one telling you about how to do that, though. Right. But I, I, should, probably be, I should probably be nice I to you. I still didn't touch it. the camera. You remember that story? Where you brought all the people in and you said, guys, I've been doing this for a lot yeah. longer than you. And I know what I'm talking about. That's yeah. Phipps with video. I, I, <laughs> I totally agree. But that camera's been that height the whole time you moved it up and down. Fair enough, anyway. Fair <laughs> <laughs> I, I love this conversation. First of all, PCP is like, this is the number one thing I'm always trying to talk to a, uh, new coaches about. Like, please just like start with something that they're doing well. I also think that another thing that Jordan said when we're talking about like uh, course correction, bringing it back on yourself as a leader is one of the most powerful tools that you absolutely have. And I want to tell a story about a time that Jordan did this to me and it just like it ruined me. Um, (laughs) So when Jordan was the GM at Longmont uh, for a long time, he was also the department head for the jujitsu program. So he's running our meetings uh, and there's just, you know, one meeting where, you know, I'm late. I'm probably like five or six minutes late. And uh, you know, I have three coaches coming in behind me, so I'm not even the latest one. And you know, we're sitting down for the meeting. We're starting about 10 minutes after we're supposed to. And Jordan just like, you know, gritting his teeth, like shaking. So he's like, you remember this? Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, he's, talking about he's, like, he's like, so there's something I have to get off my chest or we can't do this meeting. Right. <laughs> he says, what am I doing wrong? That you all do we need to change the time of the meeting like is there something that i can do to make sure that you are all here on time and like me as someone who's a leader in the academy and a leader in the company i'm just like i'm feeling the the worst i've ever felt and jordan could have like he could have done this completely different he's like listen motherfuckers like every one of you were late to this meeting you're all going to get fired if you do it again and he could have said that and that would have had a, a a strong impact but the way he just he didn't blame any of us he just said because obviously there's something I'm doing wrong <laughs> if we can't all You're be here on time. All right, so I must be fucking <laughs> he, this He's up. like, so Did? please. Yep. And he went around in a circle. He's like, can you tell me uh, how I can how I can make this easier for all of you? And all of us like, we were just late, Jordan. We're sorry. <laughs> and listen, I, I was not late to any more meetings after that. And it's like, I should have been late in the first place. But there's, there's multiple ways for that to be handled. And Jordan just like put it all on him and it made me feel a hundred times worse than if he would have just yelled at me and said <laughs> you're gonna get fired if you do that again and i think it's because you'd get a little bit of fuck that guy yeah a exactly. little bit like exactly. man he doesn't know what i was just doing yeah and then you should you should also tell the story about where you did have that reaction to me about fuck this guy I don't even want to coach jujitsu anymore. That, yeah. Well, you can that tell was, that. I give you okay, permission. So that was a different situation. <laughs> and, and listen, like, uh, as our relationship has progressed, especially in Longmont when he was a GM and I was a department head, like, Jordan gave me a lot of freedom, maybe more freedom than I should have had, like, in my position. Um, well, we can talk about that later. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. but, Jordan, we'll, sauna. we'll talk yeah, about that. But, in the sauna. but Jordan trusted me a lot. And on both sides, even on the jiu jitsu side where I was a coach, but I wasn't in the management position. And we had this guy coming in, um, had a lot of previous experience. And uh, I didn't realize that Jordan had told him, like, hey, I want you to do fundies for a little while before you start training. Uh, and I had known him. I had seen him at Gold's Gym before I had talked to him. I, I had God, been... you guys love Gold's. Gold's comes up every time we come. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah. that's, that's our spot. gym. That's where we work. Yeah. 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 Um, but I had talked to him, and I knew him through other people as well. And so I knew he had a lot of experience. He was a blue belt. Um, and I was, like, oh, I was like, oh, dude, you're training here now? Awesome. Hell yeah, come to my, come to my Noki class. Like, come train with us. He's like, oh, yeah, well, he didn't really tell me that Jordan had kind of said fundies only. I'm like, oh, you're totally good. Come train with us. And then I jumped in the coach's group uh, on our Voxer after that and just let everyone know, like, hey, this is the conversation I had with this student. You know, I told him to come. He's got a ton of experience. And Jordan was like, well, first of all, Jordan, <laughs> I think Jordan's first message was probably like one of the most unskillful. Yes, Jordan. it was. It was so unskillful. It was. That Say I, what it was. I, <laughs> do you remember? Because I do. It, it was, what was it? I just typed in the, the thread. 
What the fuck? fuck? Yes. <laughs> In Jordan's defense, before I could even open Boxer to reply, he had already recalled that. Message. But you saw what? But you saw oh, what? Yeah. The fuck? You yeah. could, see the, you could yeah. see the preview, so I right. saw the preview message, and then the way Jordan kind of like. He kind of stripped me of my authority. He's like, where do you, you know, kind of like, he stripped me of this authority that he had kind of granted me just like, not, not by saying it, but just right. through our relationship. And I felt like very like cut down in a way uh, where I was like, man, shit, like, I don't want to, like, I don't want to deal with this. Like, this doesn't feel good to deal with. And, and, and like, that was probably yeah, a, an example of, of an unskillful way of handling it. And that's kind of the two ways, because instead of like looking at myself and saying, wow, I really let Jordan down. Like I need to be better, which was my reaction after being late to the meeting, my reaction was like, fuck this. I'm quitting. <laughs> like, I'm not going to coach so, you. Jitsu look, this is, luck, just, bro. this is just, yeah. this, this is just parenting again. Yeah. It, it I, I had it this week with my student. son. Yeah. My son. Fits. <laughs> no, I'm serious. This. So like I had it this week, a student came up to me on Tuesday and asked, he was like, Hey, uh, I know that, which McCall the the advanced class is normally only blue belts and up. I have four stripe white. I, I'm I'm four stripes and he said something. I don't remember how it went, but he brought Carlos up, and of like saying that Carlos said in some way that he could come to my advanced class, mm -hmm. and uh, rather than like before, I'd be like, man, what the fuck are you talking about, Los? No, Los, what the fuck, right? You have to just like go to the parent, the other parent first. Like when, when my kid says something, Hey, I'm going to go do this. And you're like, well, did mom say it was okay? So that way you can hear, you know, that like, that's my first dad. Can I, and my first question is always, well, did you ask your mom so that I don't have to be like, cause, cause you know, the next thing they're going to say is mom said it was okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Did you ask your mom? Yes. Okay. What did she say? Great. I agree with mom. Yeah. So it's like, okay. So you're telling me Carlos gave you permission. Yes? Okay, great. We'll see you in class. Yeah. Because that way you don't want to yeah. like shit on Carlos. Yeah. And then get mad at both of them. Yeah. I felt really bad about that incident between Phipps and I when I reacted that way and and I think I repaired it because we had our same page meeting and then, you know, I gave and this is another way of like uh, helping people is you first open the door for them to give you feedback. Like if you have feedback for that, and that this particular day, I didn't have any feedback for Phipps. I could just tell that like I had hurt our relationship and I needed to repair. Right. And sometimes you have to do that. Like when you deliver feedback unskillfully, you may do some damage and you got to own that shit and you got to repair. So in our next same page meeting, we went through the business, but then I was like, man, I just, I want to give you the space to like, tell me how you felt, you know? And I remember when Phipps walked into the office that day, like I could tell there was a wall. You know, but then after he had the space to tell me uh, how he felt and then it, it honed in on something where it was just really a miscommunication. Like when he told me, he was like, man, I felt like you had already given me this power and then you took it away from me. I was like, oh, fuck. Like, I didn't mean to do that. With, yeah. You know, like I and it was true because it was like, man, I, I do trust Phipps and, and I do want to empower him to make those decisions in that decentralized command model, you know? Mm -hmm. I just, you know, and this also comes back to, I think a key to skillful communication that I'm learning is, is taking care of yourself. And like in that particular day, week or whatever, I had just dealt with some shit, mm -hmm. you know? And I won't get into what it was. Phipps knows what it was because he had to deal with it too. But like, I just, I reacted poorly. You know, because my cup was not full. I was not taking care of myself. And so I think part of delivering skillful feedback as well is making sure that you're uh, taking care of yourself, you know, and that you're bringing your best self to your communication. Um, there's a good book Alex recommended to me, The Elevated Communicator. Um, talks a lot about that. It was very helpful. I think jump in real quick <clears throat> not just in your communication but like as a coach it's it's the same thing as a coach and you talked about on wednesday you just yeah. came in you just weren't like is right. where you would have wanted to be most of the time mm -hmm. and, and taking care of yourself in any situation where like you are giving to other people in, in either a management communication coaching 
you want to be the best version of yourself. And that always comes back to like taking care of yourself and, and making yes. sure that and you, you have to realize that that's depleting. Yeah. Giving yes. to other people, introvert, extrovert. I don't care who you are mm -hmm. giving to other people is depleting. Absolutely. Right. Yes. You know, now look, yes. if you're just out with other people and you're an extrovert, that's a different thing, right. but having to give all the time, you know, mm -hmm. is very, very depleting. So, mm -hmm. um, man, I, I love the end of that conversation that we just had there because it, uh, uh, we're, we're giving advice here on this podcast. That's what we do with, with Easton Online in general is, mm -hmm. is how to run your academy. We gave a great example of how Jordan did it well. And then we gave an example of how Jordan did it really shitty. Yeah. Right? Because we fuck up too. I fuck up. You fuck up. You fuck up. Absolutely. Mike fucks up. Ian fucks up. We all still blow this. Right? Yes. We all still blow this. And this, it's this iterative process where we're going back and fixing it, course correcting. Right? And the hardest part is when you blow the relationship. Right. And, and it affects where well, you blow something and it affects the relationship. And then you have to course correct on that. Because what we don't want to be doing is running dictatorships. Right. We really, really don't want to be running dictatorships. That's not what we're doing. Uh, we, we don't have the way. Right. We're, we're always changing the way. It's focused on the core values, followed by the principles. And then we go. And then we go, we, we find the best answer. So, uh, guys, great talk, great podcast. One yeah, question, right? One question, you know, one question. And we just that, get, yeah, and we got we, going. We, we knocked it out. Uh, Phipps, if you could leave that camera just how it is, I don't have to uh, <laughs> film for a little bit. Uh, actually, I do this week. So I'm, sure I'm going to move it down. Yeah, I'm sure you will. Uh, I'm going to move it down. Okay, so. Uh, as you, as you're, you're, as you you're going to have to move it back up for the next time. Do. Right, don't so change my settings. I will not change the settings. I turn the camera on and off. Don't edit this out, <laughs> um, guys. As always, if you found this helpful, Easton Online. Okay, uh, check us out. Share it. Uh, if you have another, oh man, I am butchering this outro. If you found this helpful, please go to Easton Online if you would like some more help. Also, share it with your friends who are other academy owners, even business owners. I think we, we touch on some broader topics as well outside of just, you know, martial arts. Um, if you need help, please contact us, right? We are here to help. Uh, he is not on social media. Phipps and I are. Uh, but so we, we will answer questions over social media if you, if you need something. Hey, tell me about this. Tell me about that. Um, we have a bunch of freebies out there uh, all over the place on our website, on our Instagram, on our social medias. And um, I think that's it. Fellas, great talk. Let's go sauna a little bit. And uh, that's it. Peace.